from pursuing education equity by giving underserved children access to a private 5G network, using AI to detect and predict depression, to helping athletes win gold with data-driven training. All these things are what make our lives and the world extraordinary. And all these things are powered by Intel. How wonderful is that? Learn more at intel.com forward slash how wonderful. A few months ago, Portland seemed poised to finally change its unusual form of government. But now the reform effort headed to voters is anything but a slam dunk. I'm Andrew Thien, and this is Beat Check with the Oregonian. Up next, Shane Dixon Kavanaugh, Portland City Hall reporter for the Oregonian and Oregon Live. We talked about what happened to all the positive vibes surrounding the charter reform movement, why one commissioner is leading a charge to present a different proposal next year, and all the nitty gritty details included in the package. Here's our conversation. Shane Dixon Kavanaugh, thanks for coming back on the show. Andrew, it's a pleasure being back, and I'm I'm really excited to be chatting about the city's charter reform proposal with you again. I know. it's it, We talked about this before many weeks ago at this point, maybe months, I don't know. But this is the umpteenth time Portland has tried to reform its government. It felt like maybe this was the time that it would pass, but suddenly there's a lot of, uh, a lot of stories that you've been pumping out, a lot of uncertainty. What happened? Now, that's a great question. Uh, and first, I think it's worth just sort of noting, and in the most recent story that I did, I mean, we sort of put this at the very top of the story, at least from sort of, you know, our perspective as political reporters here at the Oregonian, that this proposal that's going before Portland voters uh, in November's ballot is arguably, and I think it's, you know, quite convincing to say the most sort of consequential thing that residents in the city, you know, may vote on. Uh, This election cycle, and it is probably the most important or most consequential ballot measure uh, to come before Portlanders in recent memory. But in answer to your question of what exactly happened, well, the city's uh, appointed charter commission came out with its final proposal in June. And instead of attracting sort of universal support, it has quickly become a battle between uh, proponents of the measure and folks who who say they have a lot of questions or concerns mm-hmm. about whether or not uh, the proposal that was uh, crafted by the commission is going to be able to meaningfully address a lot of the problems and issues that have been sort of front and center um, with City Hall in, over the last few years. Yeah, it's um I'm glad you pointed out that, you know, I think this process was like a year long and everyone was was invested in it. You know, the mayor was talking about how important it was, members of city council were talking about how important it was to varying degrees, but then when it landed, it was it was uh not that not that way, right? It was not received um with the acclaim, I guess. So, what exactly is the rationale behind that when you were talking to people who are opposing it both in, in elected office and uh, from the outside? Yeah. And I think the, you know, the sort of key context here, and you brought it up at the very beginning was that while Portlanders have repeatedly voted down substantial changes to the city's form of government, essentially revising or amending our city charter, while that's happened numerous times in the past, it was sort of uh, assumed that this was going to be different this time around in that there was near universal consensus going into this process that there are tremendous problems with current uh, with portland's current form of government and that some substantial changes to how the city operates and runs elections would help sort of address a number of the crises that the city seems to be unable to sort of meaningfully address. And so before there was a final proposal, uh, you know, from all sort of corners of, you know, civic 
life here in Portland, Mm -hmm. people are essentially saying, we need charter reform, we need to change our form of government. And even before a proposal was finally put out there, uh, a lot of folks were essentially endorsing the idea before any final details were sort of laid out. And then came the proposal itself, and that sort of changed everything. And so I guess to sort of understand why there are people who are now not supporting this proposed version of changes, you have to look at what's in the proposal itself. And mm-hmm. essentially, the Charter Commission's proposal, ballot proposal, would essentially, uh, and I, I think it's not, you know not an understatement to say that it would sort of radically uh, reconfigure uh, the city's form of government and also how it does elections here. So uh, the simplest way to sort of break it down is into three separate buckets. So first, as uh, most of our listeners are probably aware, Portland has this uh, sort of anomalous and unique commission form of government, which essentially means that the mayor and members of the city council, in addition to playing a legislative role at Portland City Hall, also serve uh, an an executive function. Elected city council members and the mayor run and manage the bureaucracy. They run bureaus and agencies at the city of Portland. And this proposal would essentially take that responsibility away from elected officials and put it in the hands of a professional city administrator or city manager that the mayor would oversee. Now, in addition to that, the other sort of significant change with the form of government uh, that is being proposed in this measure is that the mayor, while sort of being in charge of the city administrator or city manager, would no longer be a voting member of the city council. Uh, except in the event of a tie, and hmm. the mayor uh, would also not have any veto power. And we can get to that maybe a little bit later, because that's a controversial piece of this proposal. Uh, additionally, the Portland City Council would grow significantly. There's currently five members, if you include the mayor. The council under this proposal uh, would become a 12-member city council plus the mayor, so basically 13 people. And the way in which these uh, uh, council members would be elected would be across four geographic districts in the city, which are have yet to be determined what the boundaries for those districts would be. And three members of the city council would be elected out of each district through a form of ranked choice voting that is known as uh, proportional representation. So all three members would be running for a uh, a seat at the city council at the same time in each district, and that through the proportional representation system to essentially win a spot on the city council, you would only need to get 25% of the vote to win a spot on the city council in that one election, and then you would serve your term on council. So that is, I mean, I've just been sort of uh, rambling on here a little bit about the details of this proposal. And uh, it is, I mean, it's substantial changes and there's a substantial amount of detail with each of these sort of components. But essentially, uh, the folks that have pause with this idea or concept are individuals who are largely supportive of uh, getting rid of the commission form of government that we currently have, but sort of feel that the mayor in this current uh, proposed configuration, reconfiguration, doesn't have enough power because uh, the mayor doesn't have uh, a veto or is not a voting member of council. And there are also a lot of questions or concerns among opponents about whether or not this form of electing council members, which is, you know, uh, essentially what we call multi-member districts and ranked choice voting combined, uh, that, that it's known as proportional representation or single mm-hmm. transferable vote. Uh, it is a very sort of novel approach toward elections in the United States, even though some versions of it are practiced overseas and in other countries. So opponents have largely sort of articulated or have claimed that we would essentially go from a form of government 
that is not working here in Portland and is novel and unique and is ineffective, uh, we, uh, we would essentially replace that with a form of government that we're not quite convinced of, or we don't have a level of certainty about what the outcome would be, but essentially um, it would be sort of a large uh, and a, a large experiment that some feel uh, it is not worth testing. Yeah, it's kind of fitting, Shane. Uh, Portland is currently weird in terms of its political system. We're an outlier, and under this plan, uh, should voters approve it, uh, we would be an outlier and have a very unique system compared to other American cities. Yeah, that's correct. So obviously you've kind of laid out the opposition and, and kind of the concerns there, but you know, a lot of people spent a good chunk of their time volunteering their time to craft this proposal. So what, what are the people who are in that room on the charter commission say to, um, you know, this, somewhat sudden opposition that that's materialized once we have the actual plan in place? What, what what are their responses? Just to start and sort of reiterate, and we talked about this when I was on the podcast previously to discuss the Charter Commission and some of the proposals they were looking at. But so this commission was uh, you know appointed by the mayor and city council. Every 10 years, a charter commission is sort of impaneled with the city and they can make recommendations uh, to changes to the city's charter, which is essentially the city's constitution or founding document. And this group, this 20 member uh, appointed volunteer group spent essentially 18 months uh, doing research, holding public outreach events, uh, and, uh, and working on crafting this proposal. And while the proposal that they've come up with is fairly unique in terms within the context of, uh, U.S. Uh, municipal government and elections, you know, what the re, the, the sort of I spent a bit of time speaking with commission members for this most recent story to get a better sense of, you know, what was sort of the, you know, guiding principles here mm -hmm. uh, and what brought them to this, uh, you know, to this package of proposed changes. And essentially, you know, one of the most sort of important things for members on this commission was to figure out a, what they believe would be a form of government and election system in Portland that would essentially uh, be more sort of inclusive uh, and open to getting a wider variety of individuals uh, being elected to city council with uh, a more diverse set of political perspectives and, uh, and, and backgrounds. And they believe that through having this proportional representation system, again, where you're having three people running for city council at once and that three people end up getting elected and voters are given the opportunity to rank uh, and uh, their, uh, their preferred choice of candidates sort of mm -hmm. in order that through this type of system, you get, uh, you get a wider variety of uh, political preferences and points of view uh, are essentially sort of driving the election of candidates. Obviously, you mentioned the geographic areas haven't been settled on yet. And obviously, it, the voters were, will have their say on on this proposal. But like, you know, for example, if someone lived in St. John's, there could be three different seats up for grabs with, you know, um, six different people running and you would fill out a ballot and go one, two, three, and those are your top three picks, essentially? Well, you would actually, uh, as of right now, um, based on how the proposal is currently written, that A, there could be you know far more than six people running in a city council race in mm -hmm. one of these four geographic districts, which uh, you know, if we're carving up the city into quadrants for uh, a elective geographic districts, those are each going to be about the size of Eugene or Salem. Um, and you could have, I mean, as many people running for a seat on the city council in each one of those districts. And voters, uh, I don't believe, are capped at the number of candidates that they could rank. 
So you can fill out a ballot and just put one person on it if you're only interested in, in one of the candidates. Or if there were 15 people running, you could rank uh, all 15 candidates in order of preference. So there's not a cap on the number of people you can rank. And through the sort of proportional representation system, uh, the, you know, the, there is a system and formula in place that would essentially, um, you know, elect, end up electing three of the candidates running in each district, uh, and, uh, and with 25% of the vote. All right. So we're both, you know, pretty plugged in to politics and elections and, uh, you know, just civic life, but just listening to you. I start to have my head spin a little bit and I, I'm interested in and aware of the topic. When you talk to people who um, kind of observe governments or, um, you know, maybe aren't on one, one side of the campaign or the other, like, is this a pretty big ask of voters to comprehend this type of thing? Um, again, not that voters aren't smart, but it's a big complex issue um, what, what's the general sense of these types of things when they go to voters? Is it, is it something that, uh, <laughs> that is, uh, likely to pass? Um, I know that's kind of a blanket statement, but I think you kind of get the gist that it's like, this is a dense thing. Uh, it's a big thing to ask. Well, you know, what's interesting about it, Andrew, is that it is complex, Sort of, but it's also, and the, you know, and the supporters and proponents of, uh, multi-member ranked choice voting or proportional representation would argue that it's actually not that, it's actually not that complicated because at the end of the day, voters are, you just have to rank your candidates in order of preference. So yeah. if you make that, uh, you know, if you make that argument to voters, I mean, that you know that's a that that is pretty intelligible and people can understand that where it becomes a little trickier i think is if voters want to sort of uh understand uh the the sort of mechanics of how this ends up working and how three people are ultimately selected through this and you know i think that's where uh, skeptics of this proposal will point out that it's a very complex system. And there's some merit to that argument as well. Like, for instance, and uh, we in the online version of the story included a video that sort of explains how proportional representation voting works. And, you know, this is a professionally done video. It's comprehensive, takes you through the whole process. That video is two and a half minutes long. Mm. And, you know, and that's somebody, you know, and that was produced by professionals who, you know, basically this was their sort of most concise and simple way of explaining the entire process for how this type of voting system ends up electing these three candidates. So, I mean, if it takes, you know, a, you know, at a minimum two and a half minutes to make a sort of compelling explanation with visual aids and everything, so yeah, that might be uh, a little difficult for some folks to wrap their heads around or to give them pause or to ask, you know, or to sort of, you know, prompt them to sort of ask more questions or, and again, since uh, this type of voting system is hardly at all used in the United States right now, there is sort of that foreignness to it. You know, we're not accustomed to rep uh, electing multiple candidates through in, in a, in a single election like this. So, yeah. you know, so it's just not part, it's not been traditionally part of American voting here in the United States, number one. And, you know, I think the other sort of issue too, where there has been some discussion and debate and disagreement is over that 25% threshold as well. Because on the one hand, uh, and a lot of folks will point out like, really? Somebody can get elected to the Portland City Council with only 25% of the vote. That doesn't seem, you know, that's not a majority of people. That doesn't mm -hmm. take a lot. And what the supporters or proponents of this measure point out is number one, under the system, and we didn't mention this earlier, primary elections would be eliminated. So we okay. would no longer have a primary and general election. We would have for municipal elections, just one election in November, the general election. That makes sense. 
yeah. So proponents. So here's here here is sort of the uh, you know w- what the supporters and proponents of this measure point out. Number one, uh, po- another re- again, they want to sort of maximize uh, sort of uh, you know d- a diversity of viewpoints and perspectives reflected in the electorate, or I mean, in the folks who are elected to office, and they want to sort of maximize the number of people who are having a say in our election system. And so primary elections, uh, you know, as a lot of folks know, have substantially lower voter turnout than general elections. So supporters will, uh, and you'll hear them argue and say that, you know, if 25% of the vote sounds little to you, here's a thought exercise. (laughs) Uh, In in this last May's election, when uh, voter turnout in May of 2022 in Portland, mm-hmm. in the local elections, was like 35, 36% of Portland voters. And somebody like Dan Ryan, who won his primary with more than 50% of the vote, and because Dan Ryan won with more than 50% of the vote, he doesn't have to run in the general election. Uh, so what's, you know, what's essentially 54% of 35% of the vote? <laughs> you know, that's actually like 20% of Portland voters cast a ballot for Dan Ryan, and he's getting a four-year term in our current system. So the proponents would essentially argue, we already have a system in place where at times, individuals are elected to office with fewer than 25% of the vote. Um, but, even, but, even with that, but even with that argument uh, being sort of made and articulated, um, you know, based on my conversations with a lot of folks, it still just doesn't sit well with Portlanders. With with uh, with some Portlanders, yeah, no, and um, I know this is a crazy thing, but um, you know, you can be elected president of the United States without winning the most votes. So um, there there are unique um, uh, aspects of our electoral system on all levels. So, all right, so where do you see the kind of campaign going here in the next? few months before election day. I mean, is this going to ratchet up considerably? And um, in terms of the opposition, uh, what are you hearing um, in terms of the political landscape? I mean, that's a great question. And to sort of answer that, let's take a step back again and just sort of recall or or reflect upon uh, the fact that originally, uh, I mean, many people sort of just assumed that this uh, proposed changes to city government, charter reform this year was going to be a no-brainer, a slam dunk, something that was going to bring a broad consensus of Portlanders together and be passed overwhelmingly. And that's not, you know, and that's not the case now. And there, it's going to be uh, contested in sort of bruising and, uh, you know, contentious campaign between people who are supporting uh, the commission's proposed reforms and people who are uh, you know, vehemently opposed to them. Now, the other sort of wrinkle or twist in all of this, which <laughs> just makes it substantially more complicated, is that the uh, part of the opponent's sort of argument for why folks should not vote for this proposal is because, uh, again, the vast majority of people opposed to this proposal are in support of changes to Portland's form of government and substantial changes to Portland's form of government. They're just opposed to this particular package. And what they are arguing and are saying is that, Portlanders, if you vote this set of proposed changes down in November, we are promising or to the best of our ability, promising that a better, what they say is a better, uh, simpler uh, series of charter reform changes will get on the ballot uh, in as little as six months from now. So how exactly is that going to happen since this commission is, uh, you know, the charter commission's put together only every 10 years and they can come out with changes and then we can vote on them or not? Well, uh, it turns out (laughs) <laughs> that the Portland City Council has the ability to refer changes to the city's charter to voters at any time. All right. they need is three votes on the city council to do so. 
and they can refer those changes to the ballot uh, through that process. Now, why has the Portland City Council shied away from doing such a thing in in recent uh, in in recent memory? Even though everybody on that council agrees that their form of government that they're working in kind of sucks and it doesn't work and it's dysfunctional, well, that's a great question. <laughs> but so they haven't done so. However, both opponent, you know, one of the people who is opposed to this charter uh, proposal is Commissioner Mingus Maps, who yeah. actually ran uh, uh, when he ran for city council in 2020, was a strong proponent of charter reform. But he is in the camp that believes that this proposal by the commission uh, is sort of too experimental, too complicated. There are too many unknowns. And he is saying uh, and has already said publicly that he, on October 3rd, so coming right up here in uh, you know just a matter of days, that he is going to come out with an alternate proposal to make changes uh, and fixes to Portland's form of government. So Map Maps has not come out with that proposal yet, but he and other opponents are essentially saying that if you vote this down in November, the current proposal that's before voters down in November, he is going to get through the city council and put uh, this sort of, uh, again, what they consider to be a simpler series of changes on the ballot in May of 2023. <laughs> Got that, everyone? Makes makes sense, right? It it is kind of fitting though that um, you know, even when there's broad consensus uh in Portland around something, that it's gotta get a little messy. It's gonna get a little messy and and here we are. Well, this is kind of a big old mess right now because again, an issue where there is near universal agreement that there needs to be a change. Uh, to to how the city government operates and functions in Portland, near universal consensus, and yet now there are very entrenched uh, camps, basically disagreeing over what that change should look like. Well, Shane, thanks for making sense of it all and taking time to talk about it. Well, trying to help out with uh, helping helping readers and voters make sense of this. There's a lot there there. I would strongly encourage folks to read the story that we had come out, um, which takes a very sort of detailed and in in-depth look at both the sort of nuts and bolts of the Charter Commission's proposal, sort of the arguments for why some of the key points of contention around that. But also I would just urge our listeners to spend a lot more time looking into and researching the elements of this proposal themselves. You know, both the proponents and opponents uh, have active campaigns and websites and people who are supporting those, uh, you know, uh, you know, supporting both of those campaigns. I would spend some time on those websites. I would, you know, spend some time looking more deeply into the arguments for and against. And also a number of other news organizations, TV stations, uh, community groups uh, are all, you know, trying to unpack this a little bit more. And yeah, yeah I would just uh, uh, just say that a lot of people are spending a lot of time trying to, you know, present all of this to people in, uh, you know, in sort of a in a in a meaningful way. So I would just encourage people to, you know, spend a lot of time and find their way into this issue any way they can because it's a really big and important one. Yeah, like you said, it's probably the most significant thing that um, that voters will be voting on uh, in terms of local government in Portland uh, <laughs> for for a long time. So, absolutely. Uh, all right, thanks so much, Shane. All right, thanks, Andrew. Take care. Thanks for listening to Beat Check with the Oregonian. I shared links to some of Shane's recent stories in the episode notes. Can't get enough of the charter talk? Shane will be moderating a panel on September 29th with proponents and opponents to the series of reforms. I shared specific details in the show notes. If you like this show, give us a five-star rating and review in Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people find the show and tell a friend. Help spread the word. The best way to support our journalism is with a subscription to Oregon Live. You can do that at OregonLive.com slash pod support. Until next time.